Um, so again, thanks everyone for taking time out of your day here at 530. Uh, really appreciate you joining this session. Uh, this is a live session as part of Start TNB's AMA series. If you don't already know me, I'm Greg. I am the uh, marketing chair board member here at Start TNB. Our guest today is Mr. Will Richardson, one of the founders uh, at Admiral, also their head of product. But Will's also on the board at Start GNB and played a huge role in developing our new website and portal. Uh, he's also a former Groove Shark employee, so he's definitely been in tune with the Gainesville tech scene for a hot minute, as the kids say, as the millennials these days say. Um, before we, we get started, uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Uh, Interactive Resources, OP Software, Hutchison 352, Infotech, Feather, Santa Fe College. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we really appreciate your support in being able to put events like this up. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. If you have any questions for Will, go ahead and just drop them off in the chat and uh, he'll go ahead and answer them here live. Uh, so Will, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, take the floor, maybe give a little bit of an intro and, uh, and set the stage and, and we'll get started. Sure. Yeah. So I guess we'll start at, at the very beginning. Uh, so I, when I was in college, I didn't last long. Uh, you know, I, I, I lasted until like maybe halfway through my sophomore year. Uh, I was a software engineer, engineering major. Um, just didn't like the program that I was in. Tried out graphic design for a little bit. Didn't like that program either. Uh, so you know, I just left. I figured I'd get an internship somewhere, um, which I ended up getting. Uh, I, I got an internship at a marketing agency in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, got pretty lucky there. Um, didn't know enough about what I was doing really to, to deserve that internship, but you know, they took a chance on me. And so uh, started just making WordPress websites there. Did that for about four years um, until I decided I really wanted to you know, make a real web application um, and, and work at a real startup. Um, and so you know, I, I, I used Groove Shark at the time, um, and I, I just on a whim decided to see if they were hiring, and they were. So I applied, definitely did not expect to get the job at Groove Shark either, uh, but I guess they also decided they wanted to take a chance on me as well. Uh, got the job at Groove Shark uh, doing front end engineering work. Um, worked there for about four years uh, until it ultimately closed down in 2015. Um, while I was there, you know, I, I learned a ton. Um, I became the, one of the front end team leads there, um, working on the product, and, and that was a, a huge learning experience, um, and definitely is one of the things that got me hooked on Gainesville for sure, uh, and kind of proved to me that Gainesville, you know, has has what we need to to have a thriving uh, startup scene. Um, and so, you know, at once Groove Shark ended, uh, there was suddenly a, a bunch of friends and I, you know, we're, we're we were a bunch of talented developers that suddenly didn't have jobs. Uh, so we decided, like, why not start a company uh, out, of, out of what we have here? And so um, you know, that's when we started Admiral. Um, and we really had no idea what we were doing. We were all engineers. Uh, none of us were really, like, business people traditionally. Um, so we just knew we wanted to build something. Um, we kind of took a few months, um, floundered around a little bit, not really knowing what we were going to build or what it was going to do. Um, uh, and that's when we kind of realized, uh, you know, that we, we had experienced a problem at Groove Shark um, uh, in the form of ad blocking. We, we knew that, you know, we, we were an ad-based business at Groove Shark. We knew that ad blocking was an issue. We didn't really know how big of an issue it was. We kind of just assumed like, oh, maybe 10% of people uh, are using an ad blocker. We um, kind of left it at that. Uh, but we had no idea. So we decided that, you know, we should try and solve that problem. We should try and measure how big of a problem ad blocking is. And, and then if it is a big problem, see if we can do anything about it. So uh, that was kind of like the genesis of what Admiral has become now. Um, and we, we've since expanded into what we're calling uh, a VRM, Visitor Relationship Management, which is kind of taking the same concepts as a CRM um, and applying that to digital publishers. Um, digital publishers for a long time have just been kind of thinking about their audiences in like a really you know, wide uh, audience, um, not really thinking about creating first party relationships with their users. Um, you know, as uh, new privacy laws uh, and, and more users just become more privacy minded, um, having a, a one on one relationship with your users and being able to collect first party data and uh, being able to do consent based advertising. Um, 
and, and recover revenue from ad block users, um, you know, we, we were kind of expanding into this more wide platform. Um, and I've been, you know, kind of head of product there for almost five years now. Well, I guess five years. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's been a while. Um, you know, we've raised some money. It's been, uh, it's been a trip so far, but, uh, I think, I think that's all I got. Oh, do I have any interesting or inspiring Sweet, stories awesome. from my Thanks for the intro, days? Will. That's yeah. a good question. Yeah, and also, if you do have any other questions, guys, feel free to pop them in the chat window while while Will's talking. We'll address them. Yeah. yeah. So I'd say, like, interesting or inspiring stories from my Goof Shark days would be, um, you know, classically, you hear at a lot of startups, there's like crunch time and people will spend a lot of hours working to, to get stuff launched, which was definitely the case at Group Shark. Um, but it was, it was, everybody was extremely committed to it. Um, you know, we were building like uniquely building a music streaming application. Um, everybody at the company loved music. Uh, we love listening to music. Uh, a lot of people love playing music and uh, we were working on a lot of stuff that had truly never been done before. Um, and so I think one of my favorite memories at Groove Shark was, uh, you know, we were building a feature that we were calling broadcast, which uh, was kind of like, uh, if you know what Twitch is, um, which is like live video game streaming, um, it, it was kind of that, but for radio, um, you know, you could share your music queue and people could join and you were controlling the music they were listening to and there was a chat room, people could suggest music and vote on it. Um, There's a whole bunch of stuff that went into that. Um, and uh, developing that feature was extremely fun. And uh, just the process of developing it and launching it was, uh, was a whole lot of fun. I think we probably spent like, uh, like an entire week just in the office uh, finishing up that feature. Uh, and that was probably one of the best times I had uh, because you know, we were using the feature at the same time as we were building it. It, it, was, it was just a lot of fun. David says, hi, well, can you talk a bit on how the product has evolved during the past five years? Yeah, definitely. So our product is extremely different now than it was before. Uh, we still have like the same core product. Um, so when we started at Admiral, we started off with uh, an engagement product. So we would just pop up a message that says like, hey, we noticed you're using an ad blocker. Um, would you mind turning it off? Uh, because you like our site and you like what we do. Um, and that's still uh, like at the core of what we do, but we've expanded a lot into all of these different uh, value exchanges. So, uh, you know, we, a lot of publishers were like, well, if somebody's not willing to turn off their ad blocker, would they be willing to just pay us five bucks? Um, and so we've implemented a subscription product uh, as an alternative value exchange as well. So you can pay the publisher money if you don't want to turn off your ad blocker, um, you know, and give advertisers access to your data. Um, we've also, expanded into privacy and consent. So, you know, there's the big GDPR law in, in Europe. Um, there's the CCPA law in California. Um, there's a law that is being drafted in Canada. There's likely to be a federal privacy law that happens. And so we have, uh, you know, multiple different products that help publishers um, comply with those privacy laws. Um, kind of the goal behind expanding into all these different areas is to make sure um, that you know, publishers have a singular view of their users, so that uh, you know, if they're engaging a user for uh, you know uh, consent ask, they're not also going to engage them at the same time for an email ask or a, a social like, or uh, engage them to ask them to turn off their ad blocker. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the user experience isn't uh, uh, isn't isn't made terrible by all of these different platforms that publishers tend to use for these different things by just using a single platform. So uh, the short story is that like we're expanding horizontally quite a bit um, to, to kind of encompass as many different user experiences you could have on a digital publisher site uh, as we can to ensure that all of that data is in one spot and the user experience, uh, you know, isn't, isn't hurt by using or by solving all of these different problems that digital publishers are being forced to solve. Uh, Lee Feldman says, what do you think Gainesville can do to better support startups? Hmm. That's a tough one. Uh, I mean, I, I think one thing that uh, Gainesville doesn't lack is, is like raw talent. There's a lot of talented people in Gainesville. Um, you know, UF provides a, a really good source for talent. Um, I think, I mean, one thing that I would really like to see in Gainesville is just uh, kind of like an, uh, an open co-working space that maybe also encompasses an accelerator. 
Um, it would just be great to have a space that uh, is not a UF building that, uh, you know, startups can get together in and kind of have a lot more freedom than we currently have uh, at the hub. We're at the hub. Um, we really like it for office space. It's super convenient. Um, it's a really nice building. Um, but I, I would definitely like to see a, a non UF co working space open up. Um, and I think that would be pretty big, uh, a pretty big deal just to get, you know, more people in the startup community together more often uh, in spaces that aren't like just bars, uh, you know, spaces where you can like really sit down and collaborate. I think that would be really helpful uh, for us. And then, you know, some of the things that we're doing at Stargy and V are relevant as well. Um, you know, we're, we're doing as much as we can to help, uh, you know, current tech companies and startups hire for the positions that they have open while at the same time, like selling, uh, a, a lot of people that are be, they're trying to hire from outside of Gainesville have no idea what Gainesville is or what exists in Gainesville. So that's part of the goal behind the portal portal as well is to, you know, when you link to a job on the portal, you know, you'll also see content about, you know, what exists in Gainesville. Why would I want to live there? Um, and, I, and it, that's that's one of the main things I'm I'm working on with Star GV as well. So, Ian Massenberg says there are many alumni of Groove Shark still here in town. Who do you think besides you has had some of the biggest impact on the continued growth of Gainesville? Um, well, I'd say uh, you know the majority of people that stuck around uh, from Groove Shark in Gainesville um, are essentially at two places right now: uh, Admiral and Sharp Spring. Um, so yeah, Sharp, Sharp Spring did a whole lot to like vacuum up a bunch of Groove Shark talent as soon as uh, Groove Shark ended. And that, I think that has been really great for Sharp Spring because they got some extremely talented people. Um, you know, one of the founders of Sharp Spring is also an ex Groove Sharker. Um, and so, you know, the, the DNA of Groove Shark definitely runs, runs deep in a lot of Gainesville companies. Um, but you know, we currently still have five ex Groove Shark people. Sharp Spring has six or seven. Um, and I think that's most of the, the ex group shark people that are still in Gainesville. Um, and so I don't know about names specifically, but th those are definitely the two companies that, uh, I would say, uh, are doing the, the most to contribute to Gainesville startup and tech culture for sure that have the most group shark alumni. Favorite coffee or tea place in Gainesville. Uh, well, I would have to say Opus is probably my favorite coffee place just because it's closest to our office. Um, but I also really like Wyatt's. Um, so I, I would say those are my two favorite coffee places. Um, what changes has Admiral had to put in place due to COVID-19? In other words, uh, how are you guys faring in this pandemic? Well, the, I mean, the biggest thing that we did was that we went full remote. You know, we have offices in the hub, uh, but for months now we've been full remote. Um, and that's the biggest change. Uh, otherwise, we didn't have, you know, all of our customers are out of town. We don't really fly customers in for face-to-face -face meetings. I guess we did do a lot of travel that we aren't doing right now, which definitely makes sales more, more complicated. I'm more on the product side of things, so um, I don't see the effects of that as much, but uh, I'm sure it's having an effect. Uh, but since that's the case for everybody, I don't think it's going to be seen as, you know, weird that we don't do that. Um, in the digital publishing industry, meeting face to face is definitely a big deal uh, for a lot of different publishers. Um, you know, taking customers out to restaurants, basic sales stuff is still like a really giant thing for digital publishers. Um, but who knows? Maybe that'll change um, after after COVID stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. But our product team was already fifty percent remote. Um, you know, we're our entire product team is pretty much was already on webcam all day. Uh, talking to each other. So that hasn't really been as much of a shock for us. Um, so that's been kind of nice that we didn't have to do, you know, we didn't, it wasn't difficult to adjust to the situation for us as it, as it might've been for some other companies. Um, but so I mean, things are going fairly well for us, all things considered. Let's see, what was Groove Sharks Cafe like on a typical Wednesday? Oh man, the Groove Shark Cafe was definitely one of the best aspects of Groove Shark for sure. Uh, one, one thing the Groove Shark did was feed people really well. Um, and it was a really brilliant strategy as well. You know, Groove Shark was not known for, for paying people a, a ton of money. Uh, but one thing that did help is that they, they realized that it's cheaper to 
literally rent out an entire kitchen and cafe area and feed everybody than it would be to give them like commensurate raises uh, to support doing uh, something similar. Um, but yeah, we, we got, you know, free breakfast, lunch, and dinner at one point. Um, and, uh, you know, Josh made it a point to provide local startups, uh, with, with some free food as well, which is really cool. Um, I know some of the people from Paracosm were always in the cafe, uh, eating lunch. It, it was in the sun center, the space that, uh, I think taste is in there right now. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, that was, that was super awesome. Um, having that cafe down there. What's my favorite nature spot in and around Gainesville? Hmm. I would say the Hawthorne Trail. I don't know if that counts as a nature spot, but you go through a lot of nature. Um, spent a lot of time riding my bike out there uh, a while ago. So I, I really like the Hawthorne Trail for sure. Thanks. Those were my two questions, by the way. I asked. Will okay, nice. Popped in my head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so sorry. Just I'm just like yeah, barreling totally through all these as fast as I can. <laughs> just stop me if, uh, if I'm going too fast. I don't know. I love it. All right, uh, Lisa is going back to your comment about open workplaces. How do you think they need to be configured post COVID? Oh man, I think that question might be above my pay grade, but uh, uh, that is a good question. I mean, there's definitely gonna be a lot of anxiety about just being in close quarters with each other for sure. Um, wearing a mask all day is super annoying, but I do think like mask wearing is gonna be, is gonna be pretty important, especially in uh, you know, or open workspaces and especially in like co-working spaces where uh, you know, you don't have as much control over what people are doing. You don't have much control over like messaging to people about what they should be doing. So um, I think mask wearing is, and hand washing is going to be is probably the best things that we can do. But, you know, we'll see what happens when uh, as things start opening up. I don't know. Uh, David says, can you talk a bit about how you entered your market when you were starting out? Yeah, that's a... Uh, I, I think about, I think back to that sometimes uh, about how we entered the market and it was really just who we knew uh, initially. Uh, you know, we, being that we were starting a new analytics product, um, you know, measuring ad blocking rates, we kind of just had to think about like, well, who, like what personal friends do we have that we know that run any kind of website? Um, and so, you know, we would hit up our friends and ask them to put a tag on their website um, so that we could at least test our product out. Um, and then we kind of were able to take some of those results uh, and use them in outbound marketing emails. Um, you know, we, you know, read the book Predictable Revenue and kind of used that as our guide for, uh, you know, how we were, were going to run our sales team uh, in the beginning. So we did a lot of outbound email. Um, just, you know, gathering, uh, leads from anywhere we can going to public, literally going to publishers websites and seeing if we can find a contact email, um, and going outbound to them. Um, lots and lots and lots of email, uh, outbound email, um, which we don't rely on as much anymore. Uh, you know, now that we have a, a relatively good install base, um, I guess this is relevant to how we entered the market is that once we were able to get installed on a few publishers, you know, we have a pretty large message at the bottom of our engage uh, message that says powered by Admiral. Um, and we've surprisingly received very little pushback on including that powered by Admiral badge on every single publisher that we're on. It's only been a couple that have asked us to remove it, uh, you know, which we'll do if it's going to win us a deal. But um, that powered by badge, I think has been really big in, you know, just putting our name in people's minds for uh, ad block engagement. Uh, we've had quite a few larger publishers come to us as a result of that powered by badge. I'm pretty sure that um, uh, you know, NBC is one of our customers and I'm pretty sure that they saw us on rostory.com, which is a smaller, uh, you know, kind of left-leaning news website, but I'm pretty sure that's how they came inbound to us. So, um, you know, making yourself visible in your product is, is definitely a big deal for uh, marketing for sure. Let's see, Suzanne says, what would you say has been your biggest adjustment going from employee at Shark to co-founder at Admiral? Um, man, the biggest adjustment I think is being responsible for 
or at least feeling responsible for the success of the product itself and the success of the company. Um, it's just a whole different paradigm as far as uh, how you think about uh, what you do. Um, you know, I did feel responsible for, uh, you know, the quality of the product at Groove Shark and making sure that I was working hard uh, to get things done. And I felt responsible to my coworkers to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I was working hard for them. Uh, but, you know, feeling responsible for the success of your company and, uh, you know, whether or not the people there, you know, continue to have jobs and get paid. Uh, it's just a whole different um, frame of mind. And I'm not sure exactly how that changes uh, how I work. It's definitely scarier when, when you think about uh, the implications of like, if, if stuff doesn't go well. Um, but, you know, I just kind of don't think about that as an option too much. So uh, let's see, John says, if you can recall, who was the first customer Admiral signed? Oh man, so I think the first customer we signed was a site called Geek Zone. Uh, it's an Australian uh, tech website. And I, I think they were our first engaged customer. Um, and, and our launch on their site didn't go super well. I don't remember exactly why. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was a bit of a, a rough patch there. I think they had some specific asks about how they wanted the product to work and it just didn't really jive with what we had already built. So um, I think we were only live on that site for maybe a month or something like that, but they were our first paid customer uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions in the chat right now. Do we have... Uh, any more, any more questions? Yeah, jump in, inspire a bit. I, uh, I wanted to ask you just a, a bit more about Groove Shark, just because I've heard so many stories about it um, from my other friends. It's, it's great to hear your perspective, you know, as a co-founder here in town. Um, what sticks out to you the most uh, when it, when you think about Groove Shark's culture and sort of what they did to inspire, perhaps other cultures in town, maybe not with former group sharkers, but just inspire other companies to have this, not solely a cafe, but this, this very employee centric approach. And I'm curious to hear what, what sticks out the most. Hmm. Well, I, I would say like culture wise in Gainesville, yeah, is um, it the cafe? I mean, Josh Greenberg, who is the, the CTO and one of the co-founders of group shark, he, uh, you know, it was just super active in the community about bringing people together in the same room, um, whether it be to talk to other co-founders about like problems that they're having and facing and how to solve those things. Um, he was also super active in getting like students into the doors of Groove Shark to interact with uh, actual employees at Groove Shark. Um, you know, he started like multiple programs that was in, that were intended to like get students real experience um, of you know how to start a company. Um, you know, how to design products. Um, and it, he was just like super duper active and like giving up his own free time to make sure that uh, the, the startup scene in Gainesville was growing. Um, and I, I still don't necessarily know like how he was so successful, what he was doing. I think people, he was just like a super duper likable, nice guy. And so people like wanted to be around him and he was really successful at getting students in the door. Um, yeah, he, he, he was definitely, I think, the biggest piece about how Groove Shark was affecting Gainesville specifically. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, just Groove Shark being what it was had a unique ability to attract like super talented, super smart people. Um, there were so many people at Groove Shark uh, that, you know, were working way below what they deserve to be paid if they had been working at Google or something like that, uh, but they chose to stay in Gainesville. Um, you know, a, a ton of people that are working, that are now working at Google, working at Dropbox, working at uh, all these different like big companies. Um, I think we have one at Cloudflare, there's somebody at Twitch. Um, so, you know, everybody that didn't stay in Gainesville moved on to, to work at these, you know, big companies where they uh, can, can use their talents and take them. But uh, I mean, I think that was a big deal that uh, Groove Shark attracted a, a bunch of big brains for sure. Uh, James Thank Gibson you. says favorite business book. Um, and I really liked um, from zero to one by Peter Thiel. Uh, 
which I don't know if that necessarily counts as a business book. It's more about, um, you know, how do you take something from nothing to anything, which is, you know, the, the entire idea of starting a startup. You're not necessarily um, going from zero to a hundred. You're taking it from some, nothing to something. So uh, that, that's definitely been one of the best books that I've read that I think has affected me and in, in what we're doing at Admiral for sure. Um, is it, what do I do for fun? Oh, uh, I do a lot of different things. I, I do, I chose too many different hobbies. I like photography. I like videography. Uh, I like music. I play video games. Um, and, and given all the, all the other things I'm involved in, I don't have time to be good at any of them. So, uh, you know, I just kind of do all that stuff for fun. I definitely wish I had more time to do video stuff, but, um, yeah, those are, those are my main hobbies for sure. Have you found any new bands, artists, or musicians lately? Um, yeah, man, I'm always looking for, for, for new bands, new artists, um, which is why one reason that I'm very sad that Google Play Music is shutting down. They have a pretty good recommendation feature on there. Not as good as Groove Sharks was, but uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty serviceable. One of the bands that I listened to a lot recently is a band called Lawrence. Uh, they're kind of a pop funk band. They're a lot of fun. Um, if you were an admiral right now, what would be the best company in town that you would want to work at and why? Oh, man. That's a tough question. It's really hard for me to imagine uh, getting a job. Uh, you know, for, for, for so, like, I just always kind of knew that I really wanted to do my own thing. And so I just don't know, even if it was just by myself, I don't even know if I would have gotten a job at a different company. Um, as far as like being closest to what I'm doing right now, I think like Feather would be a super cool company to work for. Um, I really like the, the culture they have going on over there. Um, it's like culturally, I think it would probably be Feather for sure. Um, I'm interested in developing the esports scene in Gainesville. Any ideas? Ooh. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I mean, it's good that we are a, a university town, right? Um, the, you know, esports is is almost exclusively young people, especially you know, first person shooters and stuff like that. Um, man, as far as developing it, I don't know. Uh, we definitely need um, a place to do that to to game and for 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 those gamers to meet up and talk to each other for sure. Um, which maybe goes back to what a co-working space could do and help. Um, I, I don't know. Start, starting up a, an esports team is expensive, and you need the talent, and it's it's difficult. It would be really difficult to do it in a place like Gainesville. There already are some like niche scenes, I think, of people that play, uh, you know, a lot of Smash. I think that's probably the most popular local gaming scene is Smash, but. That'd be cool though. I've seen uh, examples in Atlanta when I went recently and it was pretty, pretty cool to see in action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool idea. Um, I got a question for you about start G and V. What do you know? Um, how has it, uh, how has your experience been working with start G and V and, and, you know, launching this new, you know, awesome site and this new awesome portal for individuals to you know find new job opportunities and, and stay in tune with the ecosystem. How's that been? How's that experience sort of treated you so far? Yeah, I would say it's been a lot of fun for sure. Like I love building stuff. So building the portal has been extremely fun. Um, I poured a ton of hours into it. Uh, and it's, it's fun to feel like we're getting close to, to our goal of, um, you know, the ultimate goal is to actually like build a platform that um, potentially like we could, allow other communities to use. Um, and so that's kind of why we took the, the path of, instead of like using some off the shelf software, um, you know, anybody could start up a jobs board, right? And uh, post jobs to it and call it starchingv.com or whatever. Uh, but we really wanted to build a platform that, that was unique uh, in, in how it could sell not just jobs, but also sell like a town. Um, and, and so I think, uh, you know, I'm really hoping that we can use it as a tool uh, for other communities and that other communities can use it. Um, and so uh, we're kind of in like still the early stages of that, but um, it's been really fun, but it's, it's also been extremely challenging as well. You know, like when you're doing anything public, 
uh, like start at GNV, start GNV is doing. Um, you know, there's always going to be people that are like uh, public detractors. Sometimes it's hard to uh, to handle. You know, some some of those public detractors and uh, you know dealing with that um, and also just like trying to identify the what of like what is the strategy for building a town uh, and, and their tech and startup ecosystem. How do you do that? Um, I don't think anybody has like any magic bullet answers. Uh, you know, we've read um, as a team, I think we've read multiple books uh, about how, um, you know, some people think that they uh, have been successful at doing so. And um, so a lot of those things are challenging as well because half the time those books start off with like, well, I made a bunch of money in my startup. And then so I like shipped myself off to some other town and was able to invest in all these other companies. And it's like, okay, well, we're starting without millions of dollars. So, uh, you know, wh what's our plan to do this without millions of dollars? Um, and that's definitely been the most challenging aspect is, you know, how do you, you know, uh, encourage startups in the startup scene w without being able to just hand out a bunch of money to people? Um, Let's see, James Gibson says, can you talk a bit about being on a relatively large founding team at Admiral? Are you all each intimately involved in all decisions or is it more delegated? Yeah, so that's definitely been an interesting experience as well. Sometimes I do think that like being on a much smaller like two person founding team would be a lot easier, uh, right? Like um, decisions get made faster. Uh, there's, you, you require a lot less consensus um, on things. Also, uh, you know, the fact, but it, it's also good, you know, the fact that we were four engineers, that's way more engineers than any startup really ever starts with ever. Uh, so we had a big advantage there in that we can build stuff and we can build it well, and we can build it fast. Um, and so that was a big advantage, I think for us, definitely. Um, and I, I would say our founding team is all still like very intimately involved, involved in, in a lot of the decisions we make. Um, there's very little that is, you know, a, a top-down decision. We still, uh, involve the entire founding team in all major decisions. Um, and we, we all seem to get along pretty well. So uh, I think it's, it's going as well as it could, I think. Um, but we have definitely, I think, identified in ourselves, like, I think it's important to figure out like who's good at what, right? And so um, sometimes you have to like check your ego about things and say, and be able to admit that like, oh, I don't really know about that specific aspect. So I'm going to let like this other founder make that decision um, and, you know, have, have ears instead of, instead of talking the whole time. But uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been good. I think having, having a larger, larger founding team, you know, it's, it's obviously uh, relevant as well that having a larger founding team means that everybody has less equity um, than you would have, you know, if you had two starting members, but um I don't think that's a big issue. So, uh, Suzanne says, with all the things you do and are involved in, how do you go about prioritizing? You know, I really don't. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, I, I mean, I would say like, obviously Admiral always comes first. If I, if I need to be doing something for Admiral and there's something critical for Admiral that will take precedent over anything else. But, um, you know, a lot of the times I'll just work on start GMV stuff when I feel like working on it, which is pretty often, but, uh, I don't, I don't think I have any sort of like priority in my head about, or, or like how much time I'm spending on something. I don't really measure that or anything. So, uh, speaking of will, what are your thoughts on simulation theory? <laughs> Is that like the theory that we live in a simulation, Greg? Yeah, you pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Maybe we do. I don't know. Yeah. Nothing more. I, I don't, I don't worry about it. No? Okay. That's no. a good thing. Yeah. A good <laughs> cool. Um, cool. Anyone else got any more questions for Will? If not, I have a bucket of them. So, you know, most of my time spent with Will is, is just focused on start GNB uh, initiatives and tasks. So now that I have the leisurely ability to fire away awkward questions uh, in the chat, I just might do so. Okay. First up. All right. Um, I was going to ask you your favorite Cheez-It flavor, but we talked about this before enabling yeah. the waiting room. You don't like Cheez-Its. Um, so I'm going to go with, um, if, if you could sort of talk about perhaps your favorite local restaurant. Uh, we talked about tea and coffee. Um, you know, what comes in mind with, you know, uh, local food? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm not like a super foodie or anything. I would say my, I'll just have to go with the one that I eat the most right now, which would be yeah. Dick Mondell's, because uh, nice. it's easy, close to the office. So okay, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty great. I I, I like it the burgers a lot for sure. Yeah. Uh, now, do you go Impossible Burger, Veggie Burger? You go, you know, regular. No, I don't. Re- regular old burger. I probably should eat Impossible Burgers, you know, but. No, it's okay. I understand. You know, you like having a large carbon footprint. That's fine. Sure. Um, yeah. That is that's the goal for sure. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Speaking of which, I can actually transition to this. Um, you know, are you aware of any you know local uh, you know green initiatives going on in Gainesville? You know, similar to you know we are neutral or, or whatnot that have perhaps approached Admiral or been you know supportive to Admiral and, and helping you know you as perhaps a company or just entrepreneurs be more aware of the sort of you know opportunities to be more green in Gainesville. Sure. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely aware of. Um, of them. I, we, we don't have a ton of opportunity to like work directly with them. We, you know, I think we do a lot of things naturally that are more green for sure. We, uh, you know, do as much as we can to, uh, like I ride my bike into the office, uh, whenever I am working in the office, I, I, I ride my bike there. Um, I can't say we have any like specific, uh, initiatives or efforts, uh, going on with that. We, if we had a larger office, uh, with more control over, um, you know, what actually went on in the office, if it wasn't the UF building, we would probably, you know, need to be worried more about that for sure. Um, but UF itself does a pretty good job. Um, you know, the, the hub recently switched from like paper coffee cups to they actually handed out ceramic coffee mugs to everybody. And so they do not provide cups there anymore for coffee. You have to use your, provided ceramic mugs, so everybody has reusable containers. Um, I think that's great. Um, yeah, Admiral, Admiral itself, I don't think has a ton of opportunity to do much, uh, but if you think we do, I'm definitely open to uh, riding your bike is there for sure. No, riding your bike is the most you can do. I think yeah, that's, yeah, and having, a, having an office, you know, in, the, in Gainesville, you know, providing office space in a downtown area and having an office downtown, I think is also you know, a big part of that, um, which, you know, has its drawbacks with certain companies being, you know, blurred in, into Celebration Point and perhaps, you know, the, the further side of town, um, while that, you know, real estate is is cheaper and there's nice incentives to, to be able to go that side of town. I think there's also a case for staying downtown and, and providing people the opportunity to bike, bike to work and, and stuff like that. So I think that's, that's yeah, that's great. That answers, yeah. Well, didn't dive into simulation theory, but dived into, uh, carbon footprint i appreciate it i respect it yeah. i'll just trust uh, elon musk that said he what he says it's like <laughs> likely probable that we're in a simulation right like yeah but the joe likely yeah. than not yeah yeah just watch a joe rogan po- podcast on on elon musk and yeah i guess yeah. i guess you get the gist yeah cool um you know i i've i've you know noticed uh as well just kind of keep the ball rolling until um you know we get more questions um you know, that, uh, you know, companies like the Selling Factory, which I actually see, you know, Ian and Brad here, uh, have been able to also kind of provide support to tech companies here in town, um, you know, doing things like outreach, cold outreach, and which is, you know, sort of necessary in the beginning of tech companies. I want to talk to you about that and sort of, you know, if uh, in the beginning phases of, you know, growing and scaling of teams, you know, like the Selling Factory, um, you know, can, can provide, you know, value to, to other things about companies here in town. Just want to, yeah, I'm curious about some of that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, lead generation is definitely like a mystery to a lot of people, uh, especially like me. Uh, I'm, I'm not super experienced in sales or lead generation, or anything like that. So, um, you know, if, uh, if I was running our sales team, I would absolutely be using something like the selling factory uh, to, you know, help, help guide us and just like, how do we find leads? I know a lot of local startups that have used them and benefited greatly from, from using the selling factory. I know Feather has used them and, and has had uh, good results. Um, and so uh, I think companies like that are, are for sure extremely valuable because it, that's, that's like a repeatable process, right? And uh, you don't need to, uh, you know, spend your own cycles working on something that is it's somebody else's solved for sure. Um, so using a service like that where, where you can spend your time elsewhere working on your product, I, I think are extremely valuable. Yeah. And I only bring that up. I, some other questions you can go to in the chat. I only bring that up because, you know, start GMB and, and our whole philosophy is, is to grow the, the tech and startup ecosystem. And, mm-hmm. and that's why I bring up things like local restaurants. And I think discussions about co-working spaces are fantastic. 
because this is a discussion about supporting the tech and startup companies, not necessarily highlighting them uh, as much as, as you know, uh, helping them grow and, and support them in the scene. So cool, yep. right on. Okay. Yeah, so James asked, can you talk a bit about fundraising in Admiral? Yeah. So I, I think our fundraising story is pretty unique uh, in that we raise, like we've raised a lot of money. Um, you know, our, we, we did our seed round. We raised, uh, I think when we started our seed round, we set out to raise like $700,000, um, which, you know, I think was going to get us six or seven months of runway at the size of the team that we had and, and our current uh, burn rate that we had at the time. Um, but, you know, as the process went on, um, the investors that were interested, you know, kind of started saying like, wow, we really think that you guys should be raising more. Um, and so, you know, our lead investor ended up putting in a, a ton more money and, you know, bringing more people on board. And we ended up at two and a half million, which uh, was, was a huge deal um, for sure. Uh, and I think one thing that is, is tough when you raise that amount of money is that it kind of gives you this cushion um, and you, you can actually kind of get comfortable in your position where you say like, you look at the size of your team and you say, oh, like, oh, if we just keep running at this right now, like we have two years of cash and we have time to like figure out what we're doing. Um, whereas, you know, if you raise a smaller amount of money, um, you feel pressure to, to generate revenue because um, you need to prove your product. You need to uh, get ready for the next round of funding to, to make sure that your sales numbers are up. Um, and I think that pressure is good um, to, to get you customer focused and get you really focused on what you need to do to, to make your product valuable. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we had, um, it, it certainly gave us time to, to work some more on uh, different aspects of our product that were maybe entirely helpful in the end, but I do think, you know, our, our, our sales were a little bit slower just due to the fact that, you know, we had, we had time and we had, had cushion. Um, we've since raised like what we call the seed plus round, which was another two and a half million dollars, um, which, um, you know, I don't, we didn't make the same mistake. Uh, you know, we, we poured gasoline on the fire. We hired people, um, you know, we hired more sales team. Um, we've hired more product people. Um, and our sales has definitely grown a lot faster than, than it had in the past. So, you know, I think we kind of learned our lesson there and, um, have grown sales quite a bit. So, um, I think that, that would be the only thing I would caution against as far as, uh, how, you know, raising a large sum of money works as opposed to raising a, a small amount of money. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely been pretty interesting. Um, I haven't been involved too heavily on like our pitches, you know, I've kind of been in as like a product person to give some um, insights into our team and, you know, how we work together um, and on our product strategy. Uh, you know, our CEO, Dan, is kind of, uh, you know, he's, a, he's an investment veteran. He's been around for 20 years working at uh, different uh, venture capital companies. And so he definitely knows the space inside and out, um, which has definitely helped us raise money for sure. So I imagine having Dan on the team is basically a cheat code for fundraising. I was just getting to that, but uh, we'd love to hear a bit more about the experience. Yeah, yeah. Dan is definitely, um, uh, he very, very not much knows what he's doing when it comes to fundraising. Um, you know, he's been on the investor side of thing, uh, investor side of the table many, many times. He knows exactly what investors are looking to hear, what they're uh, looking to, you know, wh what they're looking for. And uh, which has been instrumental in us being able to raise the amount of money that we that we've raised for sure. Um, yeah, when we were so, you know, in the early days of Admiral before, uh, you know, we landed on the ad blocking product, it was just us four engineers and we hadn't yet uh, connected with Dan um, on a specific problem and uh, ra raising money is is rough. Uh, you know, f formulating a pitch without really knowing what you're doing is just, it's just a really rough time without really like getting yourself invested in what investors are looking for um, and, and getting some experience. So um, yeah, ha having Dan aboard has been really, really great for us. Were those the dogs that you were, before we get started, uh, yeah. worried about barking? Yeah, we've got two, two small dogs. Oh. They bark at any noise, so. 
Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. They're, they're, they're looking out for you. you know? True. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, we have a couple of people trickling out, but you know we're wrapping up here anyway. So I think I have a couple more questions for you, um, and then we can, yeah, we can we can wrap up. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, we're in a pandemic. Um, we're getting out of the pandemic. What's a good question for Mr. Will Richardson? Um, how about this? I'll just go back to entertainment. Have you seen any TV shows, movies that have been, that have caught your eye that you binge watch? Maybe a good recommendation for the people watching here in case they're in a lull, you know, TV or yeah. short movie wise. Any recommendation? I don't know. The last popular TV show we watched was Tiger King. And that was, uh, a Good trip. Book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, we we rewatched we the entire Marvel movie series. Nice. In, in order? order? In timeline order, I was yeah, going to ask. So, okay, yeah, that's hard. You know, yeah. that's difficult. Yeah, because you're bouncing around, you know, the, the difference in quality is you, you see, it's noticeable when you start to, you know, go chronologically. Yeah, definitely. The past 15 years. Yeah, yeah, when you watch the first Iron Man, you're like, oh, this is what it was originally. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they definitely got a little, little better at uh, steering that story for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know Lee Feldman is not here anymore, but I did want to ask sort of your thoughts on the difference. This is a more serious question. The differences between sort of the past co-working spaces that have been around um, and sort of what would be different or what you would want to be different in an ideal co-working space in Gainesville, regardless of a pandemic and sort of like social distancing, which like, you know, fingers crossed, vaccine, we're all through this sure. eventually. What would that ideal scenario look like? Man, that's tough because I actually don't know. Um, I don't know like who specifically would be interested in that co-working space. You know, like the kind of people I would want to see there would be you know other people doing startups. I would want to see um, some allowance made for like U.S. students to be able to like just be in the space for free. I think that would be very valuable. Um, and, so having you know, yeah, like sorry, keep going. No, it's okay. Like yeah, like maybe you would. Uh, you know, as being part of like the entrepreneurship collective at UF or something, they would get free space. Um, uh, I, I think um, just being attractive to uh, local startups and people in the entrepreneurship scene would be extremely important. Um, I mean, hosting uh, events where you have, you know, different speakers come in, talk about stuff. Uh, I think just having a, a lively space would be important for sure. Um, obviously the basics of like, having good internet, um, you know, have, have nice facilities where I can just go find a desk, sit down, focus for a while. Um, I'd be super into that because when, you know, one of the big questions about uh, the pandemic in general is that like how many companies are going to go back to actually having a physical office space? Uh, how many companies are actually just going to go hundred percent remote? I know that's definitely a consideration at Admiral for sure. Um, should we just stay remote? forever because not having office expenses is great. Um, there's certainly some challenges to overcome there with, you know, collaboration, uh, developing like a company culture is a lot harder when everybody's far away from each other. Um, uh, you know, just being at home all the time can be rough for some people. So I would definitely like a space that isn't Starbucks, uh, you know, or a coffee shop that I, that I can just go elsewhere from my house and, and focus on something. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That's a good, those are awesome points. I think one of the, just for everyone in the room that might not know, I think one of the reasons why startups hesitate perhaps to go into a hub situation or, or perhaps a UF owned co-working space is because of the, the equity and that the, maybe the IP rights that they'd be giving up. Is that sort of the biggest hesitation? Is it perhaps the, the price tag? If maybe you could kind of, yeah, clue us in on. For, for where? For, for why a, a co-working space that's not owned by UF would be more appealing than one that is owned by UF. Yeah, so UF doesn't take any kind of equity or anything like right. that. Cool. Um, so, so that's good. I mean, I think it would that be mostly perfect. just like uh, a little bit more freedom about like what happens in the space, right? So, um, you know, at UF, you can't have any alcohol ever unless it's like a UF right. sanctioned event. Um, makes sense. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it certainly makes sense for UF to do that for yeah. sure. Um, uh, so I it just and the building itself just kind of like feels like a i don't know it's not like a warm space you know 
sure. it doesn't it doesn't feel like a space that I can relax and work in. It's it's needs a little more bit hippies. Colder. Yeah, sure. Needs more, more hippies. hippies. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Um it's understandable. Yeah, we all yeah. need more more hippies around us in our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we could all use a good a good hippie around us at all times. Okay, cool. Sorry not to poke too much in that, but I thought it was a very fascinating response to Lee's question. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to kind of poke your brain a bit more on that one. Yeah, and I think um like also there, like there used to be the hatchery, um, which was kind of just like an open space for startups. You could be a member of the hub and just come to the hatchery, which was kind of a co-working space. Um, I don't, it wasn't really like expertly set up. It was just kind of a room with some tables in it. Um, and, and that was the hatchery. But, um, you know, if you want to be in the hub now, you have to have a whole office. Um, so not everybody wants an entire office. Somebody, some people just want a space at a table. Um, and so I think uh, the amount of commitment is a little bit higher than some people are willing to give as well, especially if they're, you know, just working on an idea by themselves. Um, you don't necessarily want an office. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. Cool. All right. Well, you know, I, I, we can go ahead and, and wrap it up here. It's, you know, closing up at the end of the hour. So sure. um, before I give my outro, any sort of, you know, last final words, final remarks, I was a little bit grim, I think <laughs> for, for what I'm looking for, but. I mean, I would say, um, I'll tell everybody, uh, like, please check out startgmba.com. If you have any thoughts uh, or, or something that you think could be on there that would make it more effective in growing the community, definitely let us know. Um, we're definitely very open to some feedback on that. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say at the moment. So. Cool. Oh, awesome. One, cool. Other, one other thing I should say, maybe you were going to say it, I don't know. Uh, but... Uh, you know, every year, uh, you know, Start GMB is kind of responsible for putting on the events related to Josh Greenberg Day. Um, because of, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, we kind of had to postpone what our plans were. Um, but we are still, uh, you know, last year, we, we gave away a $5,000 grant to a local startup. I think that went to Pulse, uh, who was a local startup company. Um, the, the purpose of the grant is, is to, you know, uh, allow companies that are in the spirit that have the same kind of spirit as, as Josh Greenberg to, um, you know, flourish in Gainesville. So we're, we're raising another $5,000 grant to grant to another uh, local startup or local individual um, who we think is doing a good job at, uh, you know, embodying Josh's values in, in Gainesville. And so if you're so inclined, go to joshgreenbergday.com, donate to that grant um, so that we can keep doing that. That would be a, a huge help to us for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks, Will, for taking the time to extrovert here for an yeah. hour with all of us. And thanks, everyone, um, for, you know, for coming and supporting us. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and, you know, let you know about the AMAs coming up just next week. Uh, we have Paul, who's the CEO of OP Software, who's going to be joining us Tuesday, June, June, whoa, June 2nd. Holy cow, June is next week. Okay. And uh, John Spence uh, is going to be joining us on Thursday. Uh, and just to let you know, Colin Austin and Phoebe Cade are also speakers that will be coming up here shortly in our AMA series. And I just want to give, uh, you know, a final uh, shout out to our sponsors, uh, Interactive Resources, OP Software, Hutchison 352, Infotech Feather, and Santa Fe College. Y'all are the real MVPs. Appreciate you. Uh, Will, thank you so much. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your night tonight and hope to see you in our AMA next week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, take care, everyone. Bye.